Hey, beautiful friends. Welcome back to another episode of the Robin Graham show. I have a question for you this morning or whatever time of day it is that you're listening. Does the phrase networking or build your network make your skin crawl? For people like me who are introverts and anxious introverts to top it off, that word just does not sit well with me. And I think there are a lot of reasons for that, especially if you are a giver or someone who is a service-based business owner or entrepreneur, and you're always in the phase of giving, but you go to an event and it's just take, 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 it can rub you wrong. And today we're going to talk about that specifically, how the word network is not a verb. It's actually a noun, but there's more to it. And it all stems from relationship building, not about you getting ahead or someone getting ahead because of you. So I am very happy and very delighted to invite Ellen Poole onto the Robin Graham show. Ellen, welcome. Robin, thank you for having me and thank you for your introduction. I think you just encapsulated my theory about building networks better than I have over the past 20 years. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't give me that much credit. <laughs> your book was fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. Listeners, I'm going to hold it up for anybody watching on YouTube. And actually, Ellen's going to be very generous and she's giving you a code at the end. So be sure to listen until the end because when this would be an incredible gift for anybody you know who is into growing their career, building relationships, and wanting more opportunities to help other people. I know for me, when I meet someone, I immediately think of, and this isn't for a pat on the back, but this is just how I am innately. I think, who could I connect them to? And I love when a connection re comes to fruition and results in something good for one or both of those people that I connect. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. And Ellen is a genius at this. I do encourage you to pick up her book. Like I said, at the end, we'll give you that discount code, but it's network is not a verb. And I want you to go forward it through the episode as we're having this conversation with that in mind, that we're going to just kind of flip that phrase on its head and take a new approach. And I think you're going to see it's going to help you tremendously in the long run. Okay, Ellen, I've babbled long enough. Will you tell the listeners a little bit about you and how you got to this point in your career journey? Absolutely. So I'm a lawyer. Uh, I should say a recovering lawyer since I don't practice law now. But uh, when I graduated from college, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I kind of flailed around and it was people who wanted to help me, who suggested suggested that I might go to law school and enjoy that. And I did. And I had people along the way offering to help me. And when I graduated from law school in the Washington, D.C. area, I decided to move out to Arizona, which is where I live now. And I had come here once on vacation, fallen in love with it and said, oh, I have to live there. I love the West. Uh, but I moved out here to practice law with a firm and I didn't know anyone else in Arizona. And unfortunately, uh, right when I was graduating from law school, there was a major recession and uh, the, the law jobs were not plentiful and uh, law work was not plentiful. So even though I had moved out to Arizona to practice one kind of law, the firm where I worked didn't have any of that kind of work available and I had to practice a different kind of law and I didn't enjoy it. And so after about a year and a half, I thought I've got to have another job. This isn't what I want to do. And I said earlier, I didn't know anyone in Arizona. I actually knew one person who I had met in a previous job in DC right after college. And I went to him and I said, I need a different job. It's not working out. It's not the area of law I want to practice. And he connected me with other people uh, who then connected me with other people. And then through, through a series of events, I got a job at the state legislature. Um, from the state legislature, again, other people helped me to become very shortly after that, the CEO of an Arizona State Trade Association. Keep in mind, this was six years after, or four years after I had moved to Arizona knowing one person besides the people at my law firm. Uh, two years after I became the CEO of the Trade Association, I was named one of the 10 most influential people in Phoenix, Arizona. And I don't say this to brag, 
but I'm giving you this background that all of this happened because of connections. It all happened because of the network that I built. Uh, I stayed at that trade association for about six years. Then I went on to have a career in corporate America and uh, left that about six years ago to start my own business. And all along, people were asking me to come talk to them about networking. They said, oh, you know everybody, come talk to us, tell us how to do it. And so I would give these speeches, but I realized that I wasn't talking about networking the way we think about it. I was talking about how I built my professional network, but it had nothing to do with going to events to meet people or reaching out to people on social media. It was really getting to know three people through work and adding value for them so that in return, they wanted to help me. And that's how I built a network that allowed me to achieve all these things. Today, I still have my own business, but during the pandemic, I wrote my book. And I'm not a writer, Robin. I had, It had been suggested to me that I write a book and I would laugh. But when the pandemic hit, uh, well, of course, first I cleaned under my refrigerator. I organized <laughs> all my junior high photos. And then I thought, I have nothing to do. Maybe I'll try to write that book people have mentioned. And uh, it has turned out to open so many doors for me. And now I am so happy to enjoy, uh, as part of my career, traveling around and talking to universities, corporations, trade associations about how to build networks. Yeah, I love it so much. And at the end of the day, it's all about building relationships. And even those people who encouraged you to write the book, you have a relationship with them and they were looking out for your best interest because they saw this, this gift that you have and the perspective you have, which is unique when it comes to building your network. And listeners, I want to, I want to direct you to, to another episode with Danielle Mendoza because she is all about how to write a book to broaden your, not your network per se, but your career opportunities. And that's exactly what Ellen just mentioned. So I'm going to link that episode in the show notes. You can go back and listen to that because if you're curious about writing a book, it's a great one to consider how that can then move your career forward, help you attract new clients, give you more speaking opportunities and all those good things. So Ellen, let's dive into this. So you broke the book out into 10 tips and there are 10 tips that some of them are, here's what you should do. And then some of them are the things that you should not do. So can we just take a, a second to kind of do a quick rundown of those tips, but then do, we'll go into some depth on some of them, but not necessarily all of them. Okay, absolutely. And I'm a little nervous because I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I hope I remember them all. <laughs> I have the book um, in front of me. <laughs> and, and and I brought my own just in case. I've had people say to me, now on page 56, you say, so I learned to be prepared. But uh, of course, I remember them all. Um, and it's really one really important tip. And then nine additional tips that are sort of in service to the first one, how you can do the first one as well as possible. And the first one is, and it sounds so simple when I say it, to be good at your job, but I'm not talking about being good at your job in the way most people think about it, so that your boss is happy, or you do everything in your job description, or you get good performance reviews if you're at a company. If you're an entrepreneur, you probably have an idea in your head about making your product great or offering your service in a way that fits with what you decided to do in your own head. The kind of good at your job I'm talking about is being good at your job from the standpoint of every single person you come in contact with. It can be your clients, your purchasers. It can be someone who calls you and asks you for something. Um, people don't think about being good at their job from the standpoint of what the other person needs. And I feel like building a network is all about understanding what someone else needs and then providing them the value that helps them get that. And sometimes it's not actually what you would think it would be. And I'll get back to that because I want to tell a story that's so simple, but so illustrative of that. Um, but as far as the other tips, um, number two, believe it or not, is to be interesting. It's hard for people to remember you if you don't have something interesting to offer. And it doesn't have to be glamorous. 
Uh, it can be anything, you know, I have an Irish setter and I love dogs, just something personal about you that allows people to remember you and think of you as someone beyond the work that you do. Uh, in my book, I devote several tips, I think three, four, and five to joining organizations where you can demonstrate value to people. And then also how to talk to people at organizations and get to know them. Uh, I also, as you said, devote a couple tips to what not to do. Don't go to organizations and don't try to meet only important people. And we all want to do that, right? I love telling people the story about the time I met Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, we all love to meet quote unquote important people. Also, we all like to hang out with people who are like us. And that's a huge mistake when it comes to building a network. So one of my tips is talking about how to um, not focus only on the people like you, who you would normally gravitate to, but how to be open to building relationships with people who are very different from you. And then I talk a lot about the mechanics of network building because you can meet someone, you can provide value for them, but you need to maintain a relationship. So it's about follow-up. And then it's about interacting with them appropriately because sadly, so often in today's world, advice about networking basically says, you know, gloves off. Now that you've met someone on LinkedIn, of course you can call them and ask them to sponsor you for a job at their company. Or of course you can call them and ask them to promote your product on their show. Um, so I talk about how to be appropriate. And then my final two tips are sort of more, I don't know, spiritual, if you would, uh, one of which is to be sincere, because there is a little bit of feeling that if you do these things, is it too calculated? And so I want to offer people guidance on staying sincere while they do intentional things to build a network. And the last tip is to me, one of the most important tenets in life, and that is to have fun while you're doing it. And if you're doing it the way I advise, you will have fun because you'll get to know wonderful people and wonderful experiences will come to you. So that basically sums it up. I love it so much. And when you think about every single thing that you just said, it all comes back to building relationships. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. And I'd love to offer you this story about adding value because I feel like people hear, okay, I know you said not to focus on my performance for you, not to focus on my boss, but sometimes people struggle in, well, what does adding value mean? And it really comes down to the golden rule, putting yourself in the shoes of the other person. So I live out here in Arizona, as I said, and I have a house, it's a little older now, it was built in the eighties in Arizona, that's old. And it had these popcorn ceilings all through it. And I don't know if those are around the rest of the country, but they're these really ugly ceilings that look like popcorn got all attached to the top. Uh, and they were for insulation purposes at the time, but they're ugly and modern homes don't have them. And so I wanted to get rid of them in my house. And I have a living room, family room area with a high arch ceiling. So it was gonna be a project. And I asked around for a handyman who could do it. And I got a recommendation of a guy named Bob. And Bob was, uh, I was told he was very trustworthy. He did a really good job. So I went on a three-day business trip and I gave him the key to my house and told him what I wanted. And when I came home from the business trip, I walked in my house, Bob was putting the furniture back where it belonged and the ceiling looked amazing. He did a fantastic job. So I walked him to the front door. I had my checkbook. I said, how much do I owe you? This is amazing. He told me, I wrote the check. And as I was saying goodbye to him, I looked up and there above my head in the hallway was the light fixture. And as I said, this was a high arched ceiling. And I said, almost more to myself than to Bob, I said, tuck on it. I wish I had asked you to leave that down so I could clean it before it went back up there. And he said, well, I thought about that. And I thought that's what I would want. So I cleaned it for you before I put it back. Now, I'm sure your listeners are going to ask for the name and number of Bob at this point. <laughs> but Bob did a good job in the ceiling but what made him incredible and what made me recommend Bob to every single person I have ever met was because of that little last extra piece that he thought about what I would want, that I would want the light fixture cleaned, that for me to do it, I'd have to drag out a big ladder and, and he cleaned it. 
because he put himself in my shoes. And even though handyman work, you know, probably most of your listeners, that's not what they do for a living. Although if they do more power to them, um, but people don't really think about how what they're doing is perceived by the other person mm -hmm. and what little things can make all the difference. We're all so eager to, I'm so eager to offer someone my 10 tips that maybe I'm not thinking about how they really need to know an 11th thing that I could provide. I have to think about what are their circumstances? What will help them the most? And obviously you're doing this with input and feedback, but so often we come to things with our own ideas and we don't really understand what someone else needs. So I feel like the story of Bob is so illustrative. It is. And, you know, I want to say, emphasize something that you just said, and it really becomes about not only thinking about the other person and what their needs could be, but not making assumptions about what they need. And I think a lot of times we do that. We think, oh, well, they definitely need this. So I'm going to offer this. But we go down a path that's completely not aligned with what it is they actually need. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think empathy is also a huge component. I recently spoke to a bunch of law students and one of the students was going into practice uh, at a firm that does wills and trusts and estates for people, mm -hmm. mostly older clients, typically in yeah. that situation. And he was like, well, how do I put that into practice? Because I'm going to be taking assignments from the partners and doing the work. And I said, well, it's a small firm, so you'll probably have client interaction. Uh, and he was a young man, so he didn't have experience. I said, but think about what somebody wants when they're coming to you and doing a will. The big picture for them isn't a beautifully drafted will by a good lawyer. The big picture for them is their families and leaving their family things and taking care of people. And maybe there's, you know, some discord or, or you know, family harmony issues that they can't help and they're worried about. Or maybe they've got a child they're concerned about. And I said, Put yourself in their shoes. This is a much bigger picture than they're coming to you for a well-done legal document, which is your thinking, because you're thinking, I'm going to write the best will there ever was. But the client is thinking, this is very emotional for me, and I want to make sure that I leave with all my anxieties addressed, my concerns addressed. And that's not the same thing as a great legal document. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to do a great legal document but it's not what the client is thinking about when they come to you. And he loved that because even though he was young, it kind of put it into a picture for him. And I feel like if you apply empathy, and it's what you said a minute ago, Robin, because in that case, you are making some assumptions, but they're universal assumptions. Mm -hmm. And it's not, oh, I have to understand this client's business about, you know, creating water purifiers. It's universal assumptions about humans and human emotions and other people and the things we all want. And I think there's a point in my book when I talk about some basic things like nobody has enough time today. Nobody. I don't know anybody who says, oh, yeah, I have plenty of time. So that's an assumption you can make about another person when you're working with them. Um Everybody has things they want to do that they can't get to, partly because of that first one. So there are assumptions I think we can all make because they're all part of the human experience. And then it's like you said, it's don't make assumptions about their business or what they're looking for. That's where you ask questions. You ask them mm -hmm. empathetically, though. But it's understanding one another as humans. Yeah. And, and getting curious, right? I think curiosity is, is a key component here because anytime we get curious and we show people we are interested, we're more likely to be able to build a relationship with them. If you're in an environment and you're only talking about yourself and the other person doesn't get a word in edgewise, I mean, we all know those people and you're like, mm -hmm. well, okay, <laughs> that was a great one-sided conversation, but I think it, it happens more often than not. And I think when we put ourselves into the mode of I am not going to make an assumption of what their needs or desires related to me are or what I can provide. I'm going to get really curious and I'm going to ask them questions and get to know them and really try to understand who they are at the, at the root or at the core. Yes, I would agree. And, and the way the relationship then becomes built is another aspect of human nature, which is that all of us want to do things and help people who are valuable to us. 
If someone has been valuable to you, you can't wait to help them and do things for them. And not in a transactional sense. They gave me this, so I'm going to do this. And actually, sometimes we all feel that way, right? As people, we think, oh, you know, it's somebody I'm not close to, but they did this. And so we really ought to do, we really ought to go to their event. Oh, I don't feel like it. But when it's a real relationship based on value, like, oh, they were there for me that time when I had the flu. Of course, we're going to go over and help them, you know, build their barn because it's natural to want to do things for people who have added value to our lives. And so when you are good at your job in a way that adds value for someone else, the way Bob added value for me by making my life easier, not having to drag out a big ladder, the way this young law student, when he practices law, can reassure the clients because now he'll understand what's in their hearts when they come looking for estate planning. Then, of course, people then want to do things for you, just like I wanted to recommend. So the next time Bob came to my house to do some work, I baked brownies for him to enjoy while he was working. And I don't cook, but I wanted Bob to be happy and enjoy working for me. And so the relationship develops naturally. There's none of this artificial networking stuff where you're trying to shake somebody's hand, give them your elevator speech. That's a big one, right? Tell someone in 30 seconds or one minute all about you. That's all about you. It's not all about them, but it's so forced and artificial. Um, you know, now that I uh, wrote this book, I read a lot of books about networking and often I am so dismayed by what I read in them and the advice that they give. Uh, but I read a lot about just networking in general. And apparently there were some academic researchers who studied networking and they interviewed people and found that most people described feeling dirty after engaging in networking activities. And it's what you mentioned in your intro. It's the artificiality of it. You know, this whole, I need to get out there and shake hands and that's not building relationships. But if you add value for them, the human nature that's in all of us makes them want you in their network because you're important to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, it's funny because when we were talking right before we started to record, I told you how I, you know, I've just read the book and this morning, a local person reached out to me on, on LinkedIn to connect. So of course I said, yes, we had mutual connections. I am familiar with her business. And the next thing, you know, an hour later, I have a message saying, oh, check out our decor sale, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, I, you know, can we get to know each other first before you ask me to buy yeah. from you? And this happens so often on social media. And the listeners know that I am not anti-social media, but I'm about building relationships. And if social media, social media can help us do that, then that is amazing. That's awesome. I have really special people in my life that I've met on social media, but I don't believe social media is that place to truly build your business or the foundation for your business, that's where we should do that off social. And I think that's a perfect example of how so many people think, oh, I'm going to connect with them. They're my network now. Now they're going to buy from me. And it's not about getting someone to buy from you. It is literally about building a relationship first, building trust. That trust determines buying practices. So the more you can provide value even in little mm -hmm. ways, you know, if that person had reached out to me and said, Hey, I know you're a former photographer. Do you happen to have any need for framing? Or do you know any other photographers you could send my way? Something like that. But, and that gets me to that. The one thing that I really loved in the book was how you said, um, oh, now I'm going to lose my train of thought, but you, you talked about you know, asking the questions, but not going in and asking questions about yourself or getting yourself ahead. Let's, can we talk about that question that you asked? Because I think that's so important. Yes. And first though, I do want to say, I admire and applaud you. I recently listened to, I'm not sure if it was a podcast, but it was about an hour long episode that you did talking about social media versus SEO. And I was just oh, yeah. in my, I was alone in my house listening and I kept going yeah yeah out loud because I was in <laughs> such agreement with you thank goodness nobody else could hear me but I I just do not feel that social media is the way to build a real relationship it can happen right connection can happen anywhere and we should always be open to it but it's one thing to make a couple friends through social media 
sort of accidentally and accidentally and, and charmingly. It's another thing to dedicate all your efforts there thinking that's how you're going to build relationships. That's how you're going to build a clientele because it's not relationships. What that woman did, the message she sent you is the modern day version of placing a magazine ad 40 years ago. She sent a lot of messages out probably to a lot of people hoping some of it would stick. I mean, it's just plain old marketing. But the problem is I think people self-delude and think I'm building relationships. It's like you said, I'm building a network. She's in my network now. And that is so not true. Now, I like to be on LinkedIn with the people in my network because it's a really shorthand way of letting them know all the things I'm doing without me having to tell them each individually. But they're already in my network. I'm not using LinkedIn or any other social media to create the network because it's a false network. It's just a bunch of connections. Um, so, so I am singing the song along with you about social media uh, and its use in building relationships. Um, but as far as the question, I think one of the things people come to me about, and they say, you know, Alan, I'm following your advice and I'm adding value. And I really feel like I'm building my network and that I have authentic relationships with people, but now I wanna ask them for something. And I'm not really sure how to go about that. Um, I'm, you know, you've emphasized that I need to be appropriate. How do I know if I have the kind of relationship with somebody where I can ask them for something. And it's a critical question because as we all know, if you ask someone for too much, you, you take them aback. They maybe not only don't wanna give you that, but now they don't wanna give you other stuff because you've made them uncomfortable. And sometimes when I give speeches, um, a lot of times I will go to a company or maybe a university and I'll be working with an individual there and I'll get up in front of the group and I'll say, you know, I just met, I just met Robin. And Robin's great and we hit it off and we think the same thing. So I've decided to ask Robin to be the godparent of the baby I'm adopting. And people go, whoa. And I say, exactly. Too much, right? It's too much. And yet people do that with their networks all the time. They have a hard time assessing what request is too much for the relationship. And so my advice about handling that situation. You're building a relationship with someone. It's value-based. You want to ask them for something. You need help. The best way to go about doing that is to ask for information or advice instead of asking them to do something for you. So if you, in fact, a friend of mine did this recently. He has a coaching business uh, on a subject that's unrelated to building networks. He teaches people how to be great negotiators. And he's awesome. I got to say, I am so impressed with his work. I'd fold like a card table at the first instant. Okay, I'll take it. So he's really great at, uh, in fact, you know what, Robin, maybe you should have him on your show because women so often need help in that area. And he's just terrific. Yes. But he came to me and he said, I understand you're speaking to a lot of university audiences and it's audiences that I would like to learn how to get in front of. Do you have any advice for me about how I can do that? And I was able to comfortably offer him help and also offer him the opportunity to connect with somebody I know at a university. But had he come to me and said, will you introduce me to so-and-so at the university? Maybe I wouldn't be comfortable with that. Maybe I'm still working on that relationship. I don't know that person that well. Maybe I know that that person and he would not be a good fit. That would have put me in a very uncomfortable position. But the way that he asked it, do you have any advice for me on how to get in front of university audiences allowed me to say, yes, here's advice. And you know what? You're terrific. And I'm going to connect you with this person. So for those of you out there who are saying, you know, I'm building my relationships, I'm building my network, but I don't know how to ask for things, go with a request for information or advice and you can almost never go wrong because people usually are happy to offer advice. And again, these are people who are in your network. They already find you a value. It's not the person who reached out to you didn't know you, didn't do anything and just asked for something. I'm talking about people who are currently in your network and you just want to make sure that you nurture that relationship and build it by not asking for too much. And information or advice will take care of that every time.
And that was one of my favorite things that you talked about in the book, because even if it, if it is someone that is in your network, that's fabulous. But a lot of times we have people that aren't even in our network and we just meet and they immediately want a favor or they want to pick our brain or they want something from us. And that's exhausting. It is exhausting. And part of the problem is that typically those kind of requests flow upward. People typically want something from other people they perceive as more, and I'll use the word important, although I'm certainly not talking about importance in God's eyes, but people that perceive other people to be more important than they are professionally. Or more senior to them at their company. Yeah. Right. More experienced. They run the same kind of business, but they have a broader reach. Mm -hmm. And so often people are looking upward, which is one of the mistakes I talk about in my book, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. that making efforts to only connect with people that you perceive as important is a huge mistake because you never know when someone will be important in your life. And that's the distinction. They may be important, but from a relationship and network standpoint, it's more about importance in your life. Uh, quickly, you, you mentioned earlier that you have dogs and I love dogs. Uh, and more than 20 years ago, uh, when I worked for state government, I had a very low paying job and I had law school loans to pay. And so I started a side hustle of dog sitting for people. And I applied basically the same principles because what does any of us want when someone comes to take care of our pets while we're out of town? We want the pets to be happy, right? So I played with the dogs. I threw a tennis ball for the golden retriever. I could have filed a work comp claim for my elbow. Uh, I did everything to make these dogs happy. And the owners came home and they had had different dog sitters for the past couple of years. And they said, you know what? This is the first time we've been on a trip where our dogs have not ripped up the furniture. We love you. We want you to be our dog sitter forever. That was 20 years ago. A couple years ago, that dog mom reached out to me. She's now a high powered lawyer with big deal clients. She reached out to me to do some work for one of her clients. And that client ended up becoming my biggest client. And now, did she reach out to me only because I was a good dog sitter? No, of course not. She checked out my credentials and understood that, you know, I was doing well in the work that I'm doing, but she was predisposed to believe that I was someone who would add value because I did that for her in that capacity. But that was 20 years between the two events. And I feel like had I been thinking about, well, I'm not dog sitting for anyone important, you know, I'm going to do the basics Then I'm going to sit here at their nice house and watch TV all day, you know, they would have been fine, but I don't think she would have approached me 20 years later to connect me with the biggest client that I ever had. Yeah. So now I've lost my train of thought talking about that, but it's, I guess it's back to the important thing. Important people usually have lots of people approaching them wanting favors or advice or information. Mm -hmm. And so without putting yourself in their shoes and thinking about, wow, how would it be if people called me all the time wanting me to do things for them when they hardly know me? How, how would I feel in that situation? But if you go to people who you don't perceive as important, but who still have something to offer, you might also be better received. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so let's really quickly, because we're running out of time, but really quickly, let's change gears just a little bit, because in the book, you have some recommendations for conversation starters. And I think for anyone who does have to go to an event, maybe it is called a networking event, maybe it is a conference, maybe it's just a, who knows, a retreat, but you're going to be meeting other people. And these other people that you're meeting have the potential to, you have the potential to establish a relationship with. So what are some of those key things that we can use to start a conversation? Wow. And I, I'm, I'm sitting here going, uh-oh, uh-oh, what did I say? <laughs> uh, I think uh, the number one thing is if you can find someone where you know someone in common, because it starts a conversation off. And for those of us who are introverts, and I count myself in that category big time, uh, it's great if you know someone in common because it starts the conversation off without awkward chit chat. Um, I don't like asking somebody, what do you do? 
I feel like even though you may be there for that purpose, it comes off as so um, acquisitive. What do you do? In other words, the subtext would be, so I can figure out if I should be talking to you anymore. <laughs> um, so I'm about asking the personal questions. Um, if you go to an organization, that's one of the things that gives you a basis for conversation, where it's just going to a regular event. But if you're at an organization, so many questions lend themselves. How long have you been a member? Have you found it to be helpful? Uh, did you go to the picnic last year? Was that fun? I'd like to get involved on a committee. Can you recommend any? Uh, you know, how did you learn about this organization? So that's why I'm a huge advocate of organizations because they give you so much to talk about. A big one, personal things, uh, not intrusive personal questions, but a lot of people love to talk about their pets. Um, a lot of times you can start a conversation by bringing up your pet. You know, check your watch. I've got to get home because I've got to get my dog out for a walk. Uh, he's home waiting for me and we always go at seven. Do you have pets? Um, people love to talk about their trips. If Christmas is coming up, you know, hi, I'm so-and-so. Yeah, you know, a couple, I'm trying to get everything done this week because in a couple of weeks, we're headed out on our annual Christmas skiing vacation. I tell you, I look forward to that every year. Are you planning on taking any time off for the holidays or summer's coming? I'm so glad my kid's going to be done with school. If I can just get through this week, then we're going on our family vacation to Rhode Island. Do you take any summer vacation? But people enjoy those conversations. They feel like they are getting to know you. I realize this is counter to the advice of have your elevator speech, describe what you do, ask them if they do something that could be useful to you, but it's not really building relationships. You're just trying to get to know people. What you do is going to come out, but if you go up and market yourself to someone, they may listen politely and then they may offer their own information in return, but unless they were five minutes before you walked up thinking to themselves, you know, I have really got to find someone who can teach me how to, you know, use my iPhone better. And then that's what you do. It's not going to spark a connection mm -hmm. the same way that talking about meaningful things in your life, but not private things. Private things make people uncomfortable. I once had someone walk up to me and say something like, I just don't even know I can go home to my husband tonight. And I was like, whoa, we don't need to go there. So personal things, but not private things are a great starter for a conversation with people you don't know. And one final tip on that, always be positive. People love to complain about traffic or about the weather. If you're at an event where there's a speaker and there was something about the speaker that you didn't love, it is the worst idea in the world to try to find common ground with someone by complaining. Oh, could you believe that guy? Nobody likes a negative person. And even if they felt the same way, your relationship will have started off on a negative basis. So I always advise, keep it positive. Mm -hmm. So much is that so much of this is almost common sense, but especially for like an anxious introvert, having to go into an environment, sometimes the brain can be foggy with all of this. So these are really great tips. And I, I love to talk about this too. Like I use it, this type of an example, whenever I'm talking or doing a speaking engagement on related to anxiety for business people, because it's something that really can be intimidating. But if you approach it from that empathetic, curious, kind relationship building opportunity, as opposed to I've got to do this right, or I'm not going to get a client out of tonight's event, then you're going to be more comfortable, more relaxed, and you're going to have more fun, which mm -hmm. you'll be able to build more relationships. Ellen, this has been, Ellen. oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, and your point is, I think people get that anxiety because they think they need to get a client out of the event. And probably yeah. they need to back up and say, I don't expect to get a client out of the event, but if I can meet some people and maybe start some relationships that will lead to clients, and maybe that would ease people's anxiety a little bit, but this whole, in the next hour, I've got to get a client is not realistic. It's like saying in the next hour, I've got to get a friend. There's pressure. So I, I feel like thinking about it that way can be disappointing for people who are like, no, I want instant results. I want to go to an event and leave with five clients. But it's not realistic to think that way. And to me, that would be anxiety provoking. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> it's showing up to serve, right? And like you said, provide value, build relationships. 
more value we provide, the more relationships we'll be able to foster, create and foster, and then build trust. Okay, Ellen, this has been fabulous. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, your wisdom, and being a light to us on how we can start to approach building our network in a more positive way. So will you tell the listeners how they can connect with you, learn more from you, maybe even work with you? Yes, absolutely. So my website's the easiest. It's the name of my book, www.networkisnotaverb.com. But you can also get there by just putting in my name, ellenpool.com. Uh, and as I said, I first have to say, Robin, I'm so impressed that you read my book. Uh, I feel like this has been such a great podcast. Um, I Just for me as a guest, uh, your knowledge about what I was talking about, I felt like this was such a great conversation and I'd love to Thank offer you. a discount on the book uh, on my website to your listeners. So listeners, if you go to my website, uh, again, networkisnotaverb.com and ellenpool.com, get you to the same place and you put in Robin, that's R-O-B-Y-N, uh, you will get 15% off the purchase price. So, and I hope people will take advantage of that. Uh, and I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'm not very active on LinkedIn, but I'm relieved. I feel validated based on your comments about LinkedIn. Uh, but you can also <laughs> find me out there. So, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, listeners. Listen, this episode is airing right before Christmas. This is a great Christmas gift for anyone that you know who maybe has their own business, is in corporate, or just trying to maybe they've moved to a new area. This is a great. This literally is, there's so many examples in here and such great advice. I, I do highly encourage you to purchase the book. So Ellen, thank you so much for being here. Listeners, if you enjoyed this episode and you know someone who can benefit from it, please share it. That is how we can help more people create that ripple effect of good in the world. And if you'd be so kind to leave a rating and review, that will help me. It will help Ellen. But most of all, it'll help you because that's how I get more great guests like Ellen on the show. Thank you all for being here and I will see you all next time.